I know right off the bat this already looks completely different and weird compared to everything else that I do because it is different and weird. Got yeah, my friend, a strange man in the picture. It, yes, and my strange man friend, that sounded better in my head, <laughs> is Aaron Utek from North Dakota. North Dakota or Nebraska? Where do I say you're from now? Well, I'm presently in North Dakota. Roots okay. are in Nebraska, but... So you're a North Dakota fraud? Uh, n no, we're legit. Prove it. Uh, the bison. Oh, that was a test. They don't call it the bison, they call it the bison. A five-time national championship. I'd heard that rumor, I'm glad you went there. NDSU bison. Okay, all right, sounds good. Uh, do you want to test me on whether or not I'm a legitimate Wyomingite? No, you have the Wyoming hat, you're good. That is correct, but I'm gonna do it I anyway. I can't tell, I want one. The Cowboys. You can prove you're from Wyoming because you just say it just like it's spelled, and then everybody knows you're legit. Sounds good. And we pronounce things properly in Wyoming. So my friend Aaron is an actual pastor. People pay him money to counsel them and help them understand things about the Bible. So he knows stuff that I don't know. And you went to Denver Seminary, so you have credentials, or at least they well, gave you a hat. They did gave you me a hat, yeah. Just buy that at the bookstore? I did. At, yeah, when, I, I, was, I was there for, you know, a couple weeks. Right before you got the rejection yeah, letter? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. So here's the deal. We've both been working on the book of Ephesians, and it, we're old friends, and we call each other about stuff and process the world and so we've bounced a lot of this off of each other and I thought it would be fun to just package up some of that conversation and more of a podcasty or podcast video type vibe and just throw that on here so these are going to be ginormous videos that you may want to digest a little bit at a time or if you're into it you can just throw it on in the background you know how to operate the internet why am I telling you this here's what we're going to do we're going to just chat and tune you out here in just a second. I'm going to break this thing down into maybe six little episodes where we talk through one chapter at a time of the book of Ephesians, and we'll just see what we get out of it, and we'll probably leave all the screw-ups in here too. So if nothing else, you can watch for the train wreck value. Okay, <laughs> Ephesians, here we go. Good? Good. All right, rapid fire. Before we get into chapter one, let's set the stage. Back and forth. You say one thing that you have come across in terms of what you know about the city of Ephesus or the people of Ephesus, and then I will get to do one, and we'll go back and forth until somebody fails. It's cosmopolitan. Okay, I needed a minute to think. I wasn't totally ready. What do you mean by cosmopolitan? There I'm were people stalling. from everywhere, all over the all over the known world. There was a port city, so people came together. It was you know it was it was a crossroads. It was a big crossroads. It was multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious. It was, a, it was a big... LTV. Okay, my turn, but it's one religion in particular that was really identified with Ephesus, and that was the cult of Artemis or right. Diana. Which one is the Greek one? Which one is the Artemis Roman one? Artemis would be the Greek name. Uh, Diana would be the Roman name. Okay, got it. And her brother was Apollo, who I was just talking about in another episode uh, having to do with Philippi and stuff. Sure. So people who are paying attention might make uh, that cross Honestly, my 12-year-old could do better on the Greek mythology stuff than okay. I could, but... Uh, you, then she's making us both feel crappy. Oops. So what? Just ignore that. So, um, yeah, and, and the other thing about Artemis is the temple of Artemis huge, was there. Huge, huge. One of the seven wonders of the uh, one of the yeah, seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, it was you could easily fit a football field inside this. I've thing. Heard that? Ginormous, and uh, you know, so and the the, the physical structure. They, well, they built a, built a big building, but they did it to communicate their view of their goddess it was huge and towering and imposing and no one could thwart her i mean you you look at this physical structure and it's who's going to challenge this yeah that was the point behind yeah it. they wanted to they wanted to buy ownership of this goddess by throwing the most money and most investment at it so that they could really claim it like the person who loved the notebook the most and they laid claim to that title of being the biggest fan by going like 55 times in theaters just over the top to be able to say I like this so much that my name is joined to it but there was a financial incentive that also came with having Artemis be your patron goddess if you will of Ephesians or of the, of the Ephesians and that comes up in what Acts 19 there's an incident that tells Acts us more about that 19 yeah so being from Nebraska loving Nebraska Home of the Corn Huskers. I can say this. Um, if you travel to Nebraska, you can go to almost any place in the city, in Lincoln, and buy memorabilia that uh, 
little Herbie dolls or coffee mugs or whatever. So it's no different in the ancient world. If you went to Ephesus, you could turn around anywhere and buy a, an idol uh, to Artemis. And, uh, and so it was, it was a big economic deal. And so what comes up? Are you there yet in your series? Annette? Are you uh, I, not, not on the interwebs yet, okay, but okay. I'm getting there. Yeah, uh, it's a fascinating story. It, um, so when Christianity comes to Ephesus, people quit buying idols and it creates a, an economic crisis. Yeah, and this Demetrius, the silversmith guy, throws a fit with his silversmith guild. Yeah. And they decide to just have a riot in the theater. It's, which, another fact about Ephesus, you can still go see the theater. You can still see the theater, The yeah. theater where this whole big incident happened that is like the uh, climax of the whole story of Acts that happens yeah. in Ephesus happens in this theater. Yeah, and it's still there. Yeah, it looks like we're going to meltdown mode. Maybe Paul's going to get it right there. But Yeah, it's fascinating. And you yeah. can go to that spot. And for those of us who have a budget, you can go look at it on the internet. Yeah, that works better. And there's there's a Google Street View of Ephesus. You can really? you can cruise oh, all the ruins of Ephesus, which I guess brings me to, since we're still rapid firing and I want to win oh, this, okay. another fact about Ephesus is that it's not really there anymore. It's near, um, I can't remember what town it's close to. Izmir? It's Izmir, I think. Okay. It's, it's in Turkey. Turkey. Izmir, Turkey. And the reason that Ephesus isn't there anymore, even though it was one of the five largest mm -hmm. cities at the time of Jesus, mm -hmm. is that it's silted in. The whole harbor, the harbor silted in, has yeah. just gradually filled up. And now this town that was this great port city sits forever back from the water. And it's about four or five miles, I think. Yeah, there's it? just no reason to have yeah, so the a town there anymore. Yeah. And uh, Ephesus is one of the best preserved ancient cities uh, from the ancient world. You know, the best preserved ruins in the ancient world. It's, it's, it's a fascinating place to look at. You know at. why? Was there some concerted effort in the Middle Ages or something? Because it, it fell into disrepair it's still first millennium, right? This wasn't like a recent thing that it all silted over and quit being useful. No, I, I don't know why. Uh, just good fortune for us today. I don't have well, a good reason. Perhaps you know something. Mm. I mean, I'm going to pretend like I do, whether I do or not, sure. to seem legitimate. But the I know that... The temple of Artemis itself is it's gone. Gone. So what, I mean, they got a couple unrelated chunks of column that they sort of stapled together out in some field where a, well, bums it, it, live it, out it back. It became a swamp. Mm -hmm. Somehow, wherever it, it, the water tables rose or something really? sunk, and it's basically where that temple was is now a swamp. Oh. So it's, it's like marshy. And it's, I didn't notice that. Yeah. The, uh, I know that you can still see parts of the Temple of Artemis if you go to the Hagia Sophia. Or wait, what's it called now? It's not the Hagia Sophia now, is it? In uh, Yeah, what do they call it now that it's a mosque in Istanbul? It's a mosque? Isn't it? Isn't the Hagia Sophia uh, no. Muslimized? Well, it's, it's been circled, but I didn't know that it was. I, I don't know. I, I could be making things up. Yeah. But whatever the case, it looks like you know some of the stuff from Ephesus got pirated and repurposed. That for would be other building projects, and that would be totally Western consistent. Turkey. I mean, you can see that all over the city of Rome as well. Um, who's up, me or you? Because I wanted to sound sure. smart. Sound more. smart. Is it me? Okay. Go ahead. So another thing it's your show, you that it's our show. Another thing that I I found really interesting about the Ephesians is they apparently had an affinity for magic and practicing oh, yeah. the magic arts. Yeah. And so I, I've talked about this already in one of my episodes on the Book of Acts, dealing with Simon the Sorcerer in, what would that be, Acts 8, where he shows up? I believe so, yes. It's something like that. It's in Acts. Mm -hmm. And I know it's before 16, because that's where I'm at. But the, uh, you know, they had these papyri, and people would do magical incantations and cast hexes on other people and try to affect the outcomes of sporting events. And people bought this. I mean, it was, it was a, a major money. trade. Yeah. And, and it, like gazillions of dollars worth of magic books got burned after Paul and the whole message about Jesus showed up there and and yeah. so this was apparently a place that was really into the supernatural on a lot of different levels. It makes you wonder how much the rest of the ancient world was the same and we only have the record of Ephesus because it, what it says there, I mean, it's kind of like this picture of uh, when Indiana Jones is uh, with the Nazis and he's kind of in character as a Nazi and he's about to lose the journal that's got all the notes because they're doing the big book burning thing. They have a big book burning moment in Ephesus where people who've converted to following Christ bring their scrolls 
that have their magical spells and they they burn them together. What was the number in the footnote? They, like twenty thousand. Uh, it was just it was a lot. I don't so know was, what it I mean, means. It was, it's a lot. It, it, it was a huge sum of money. Yeah, a huge and huge sum of money. Yeah, and, and no, nobody made them burn the books. It wasn't like a status no, it wasn't dictator. A state thing. You know, no, you no, will destroy just, this. Well, I mean, so it's a spontaneous reaction yeah. against. I, I think what they viewed as a less potent expression of the supernatural mm-hmm. than what came with Paul. I would say probably even not a less potent, but a wrong, po- a, a wrong. Yeah, sure. Uh, a, a wrong ex- uh, expression of the supernatural. So it isn't so like well. <laughs> You know, I don't need this book anymore. I'm going to resell it to somebody. They burned it. They didn't want anybody else to have those. Yeah, bad ideas. they wanted it out of circulation. They, they wanted it out of circulation. So, so, so all of this is, is it your turn or my turn? Sure. Okay, I've decided it's my turn again. I don't. We, I'll put tallies up later so that we know who the winner is. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, with all of this stuff, the, it seemed like the miraculous business that happened around Paul when mm-hmm. he was in Ephesus had maybe even extra currency for these people. Yeah. They they fully accepted the idea of a spiritual world. They believed that there was something to it. They believed that humanity could interact with it. But it was very... I mean, I, I've, I've read these papyri. It's very cryptic. And by papyri, I mean these, these magical scrolls. We right. still have some of these hanging around. Mm-hmm. And well, we don't have them, but they're... The, yeah, it's not like can, in my house. Can, I, don't, I, don't, oh, okay. I, I don't keep them there, but... Yeah. You can look them up on the interwebs thanks to the magic of internet, but they, you know, they're vague. They're, there's no clear guaranteed result, and a lot of times it's the kind of thing where even if you did this incantation or cast this hex, it would still require a lot of reading between the lines to determine whether or not it even it works. It's very subjective. Works. Yeah. Whereas in the accounts of the miraculous stuff that happened there with Paul... Boom. There was I, no... Everybody was like... Attention. Yeah, either everybody lied about it mm-hmm. simultaneously, which would be contrary to their interests, mm-hmm. or like, it happened and it was compelling. Mm-hmm. And so it seems like these were the reaction of the people of Ephesus when they become Christians en masse mm-hmm. is one that says humans don't respond like that without really convincing prompting. Yeah. So, so some serious was, stuff must have happened in really yeah, public the, ways there. The, yeah. What the term that you hear thrown around today is a power encounter. You know. Um, sure. That that and, and people talk about that stuff in different parts of the world today, where Christianity is still kind of breaking in against um, you know animistic and other spiritualistic things. But the super famous one was Boniface versus Thor's oak or something like that, yeah. wasn't it? Like. Um, like a German missionary yeah. in the Middle Ages. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I might not be talking story? about the right guy. But. No, I, I can't remember if it was the right guy, but I remember that it was a, it was a, well, it would have been Catholic. It was before the Reformation, but a Christian missionary came yeah. to the Germans and challenged some guy. Uh, well, it's like some tree that they said was like invincible and that contained the spirit of Thor or whatever the German Didn't equivalent he split it with of lightning or something. Thor. I don't remember lightning bolts from his butt or eye lasers or. I think it might have just been an axe, but he didn't get. I can't remember. Mjolnered did, by doing it, and did, so people assumed. That oh, that was, that was it. That he didn't get killed by. Cutting yeah, it yeah. So at any rate, yeah. Like a lot of those stories that we hear now, I think kind of follow the pattern of yeah. stuff that we saw happen in Ephesus. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so clearly, it was really dramatic, and it because it shifted the whole city, like we said, with the, with the, um, the idol, you know, buying their little figurines to to commemorate their trip to. You know the holy site. Um, it shook up the economy. There's another story there too um, from Ephesus, where um, you know Paul had been casting out demons and, and things, and, and uh, this guy who was Jewish but had not come to accept Christ and tried to do the same thing. You know, I, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. It wasn't one guy. It was seven guys, right? Seven uh, sons of seven Skiva. guys. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and they got they tr- they were trying this and these demons just bludgeoned them just bludgeoned yeah, them yeah they, they, they ran out of the house naked and naked and bleeding, bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> so they went to exercise the demon and the demon exercised them it's yeah, kind, of, yeah. kind of Luke's little yeah. joke there maybe yeah yeah so, so there's there's another there's a huge power encounter totally totally yeah so um, there's a big thing going on there in Ephesus and well and if I remember right too in, in that account um, 
you know, the story goes that the the spirit, the possessed man, said something to the effect of, you know, Jesus I definitely know. This Paul, I've heard of him. Mm-hmm. Like, who the heck are you? And then yeah. the beating starts. And yeah. it's kind of a horror movie moment. Y- yeah. But the, uh, and, so, and so I think there's, even in that one little phrase, to the Ephesian audience, to have something that smacks of the supernatural acknowledge Paul being with Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty big yeah. negative and, affirmation, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Where a, a source that would be critical of Jesus, Paul, and Christianity is affirming yeah. the connection between yeah. Jesus, Paul, and yeah. Christianity. Yeah. No, I know this is how it works, and no, you're not on the right team. And yeah, yeah. Um, so what do we know about the the Ephesian church? Like, who was there, and how did well, it happen in the first Acts, place? from Acts, we know that was there for, oh gosh, we didn't do any, we didn't do, I didn't look in any of my old notes on Those were the rules, by the way. Those yeah, were the rules, by the I way. I couldn't look in any notes. No notes, no nothing. And I was supposed so to not bring a Bible that has notes, but I accidentally brought my Bible that has notes. But this Bible has a little bit of P in it, I think. I don't know what that's from. It molded. So I feel like that kind of evens it out, because my Bible's ratty and is missing pages. Um, so... Paul was in Ephesus for... You're moving on. I respect that. A couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. A co- I, think, I think close to two years he was in Ephesus. Longest that he was with any church? Um, yeah, because he was in Corinth for, for 18 months, about a year and a half, and he was in Ephesus for even longer. It, it was a long time. So we got to know the people well. Um, as I said, in this letter, we, we honestly don't have a lot of individual details. It's not really any individuals mentioned that are singled out, greet this person, greet this person. It, it kind of gets the impression that, if, so if, if the, the record of Acts is correct, that the, the growth curve for the Ephesian church just took off, was really sharp, and just expanded, expanded very quickly. So Paul, even there for the extended period of time that he was, would have known people, but if that growth curve continued, a couple of years later, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people that are part of this church that he doesn't know personally. So then he's writing this letter. So he's writing this letter. To an unfamiliar to people who would know him by reputation. People who would, some who would know him by name and some who would know him only by reputation. So to me that explains the, the more generic tone of the letter. It obviously would have had a personal letter carrier as well. He would have sent personal greetings with that person. That was... Tychicus was the guy carrying Tychicus, this letter. Tychicus, yeah. Is it Tychicus? Have I said that wrong my entire life? Because um, I've definitely been saying that my entire life. I think if my you s- second word was Tychicus, pronounced it in Greek. Not even going to ask me what my first word was. The Y <laughs> would be a, a U sound. It's oh. an upsilon, so it'd be like well, Tychicus or something like that. We went to Greece I, together, I, and one of us read all the signs and was functional in Greek, <laughs> and the other of us had his lack of paying attention to his Greek training exposed. <laughs> And I think we both know which was which. I was far from functional. Uh, you, I could read the signs. You outperformed me. But that also was balanced out by the fact that you violated one of the prime directives of being a passenger in a car by reaching across the vehicle and trying to rob me of the steering wheel because you saw a gas station we needed to go to, which resulted in an extended lecture. Pulled over the vehicle in Greece. We're still friends. God. You had to bring that so we, up. Yeah, I'm bringing this up. Now they're in on it. So there was a there was a strike when we were in Greece together, yeah, and all the gas strike. stations shut down in the in the entire country. And we rented this car, and they wanted a full tank when we returned it. Yeah. But literally, it, there's no gas. There's no gas. You can't we buy were, gas because the government owns the gas. We were rolling in on fumes, and and uh, oh, there's an empty one. There's an empty, it's on. The lights are still on. Turn in. And that's not the gesture you made. Let me try it again. What he actually did is in the passenger seat while I was in traffic in Greece, was he said, oh, there's an empty one. There's no like, traffic. I'll just, by the airport. I'll just steer you over there. It was 10 o'clock I at got night the, in an empty airport terminal. It was an outrage. It was a violation of my sovereignty as the driver. I'll own that much, but there was no traffic. <laughs> I don't think there was traffic. That's the day. And we went to uh, the... We saw Corinth. Temple of Poseidon that day, right? Yeah. That we was the Temple of Poseidon the, day? In the Attic Peninsula, yeah. Good heavens, that was a nice trip. That was awesome. We didn't get to Ephesus, though. No. Wrong country. Yeah. Wrong side of the Aegean. We'll do it another time. Yeah. Um, so the first contact in Ephesus 
And I honestly, I, I don't know, so now you're gonna show me up. Was that Apollos, or Apollos and uh, Priscilla and Aquila were there? Came over from Corinth? I believe they so. They were Roman Christians, right? That showed up yeah. in Ephesus for a yes. while. Mm -hmm. Then they ran into those. Look. So in the early goings in Ephesus, they ran into those um, followers of John, right? And they're like, oh, you know, we, we know stuff about John the Baptist and John's baptism. And then it was actually Priscilla and Aquila who helped. I should have prepared this, but we had rules. Um, yeah, the verse, chapter 18, verse 1. Okay. Um, Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. Oh, no, that's in Corinth, I'm sorry. Okay, so we're at end of 18, yeah, yeah, like yeah. verse 23 and beginning of 19. Yeah, 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 here it is. Okay, so this is where the whole Apollos thing happened. So the Apollos guy was yes. from Egypt, I assume, Alexandria. There are a lot of Alexandrias. And he was pretty smart and knew a bunch of stuff about stuff, but he was most familiar with the teachings of John the Baptist and taught about Jesus via the teachings of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And so then he shows up and is speaking at the synagogue, and then Paul's friends, Priscilla and Aquila, are like, hey, there's some stuff you might want to know. And they chat that up. Apollos becomes an ally. Then there's another round of followers of John the Baptist who show up there. And they all kind of end up on the same page. And then we get into those stories about Ephesus we were talking right. about. Mm -hmm. So the Ephesian church is really more, like it's a third generation church. It's born out of people Paul went and worked with going there and putting down roots and being attentive. So it's kind of like a pyramid scheme where Paul is at the top of the doTERRA pyramid and you've got Priscilla and Aquila here. Or I guess I could just go generational instead so it sounds less shady since it was no, actually no, kind of a good thing. Like <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I, well, probably not even generational, but it, it was just always, it was all in that first generation, but it was from different sources. So Paul wasn't the one that was first brought Christianity to Ephesus. It was... Well, we don't, it doesn't actually say. Um, Priscilla and Aquila were there, Apollos was there. It's quite possible that there would have been people from the moment of Pentecost when the, the Jews were in Jerusalem sure. celebrating Pentecost. And, and uh, they, you know, they were, there were people among there, among that crowd who heard the gospel preached with the whole speaking in tongues thing. And, and because it says then, they all, you know, the implication is all those people would have then gone home. Yeah, so this might have had traction for a good chunk of time. Because where are we at? We're probably like at 50, 52 or 53 AD by the time well, that's, we get to the Ephesus stuff. By the time you write the, these, the, the accounts in Acts are probably much before, much sooner than that. The letters, the writing of the letters. Oh, but this is third missionary journey. This has got to be like mid-50s. The letters, like, when, it, when was Ephesians written? Uh, again, you didn't let me look at my notes. No, right. sorry, man. Um, and I am completely going to cheat. Third missionary journey, this has it 56 to 58. Okay. I think I'd heard like okay. 54, 55 even. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's a whole other thing to figure out yeah, how people right. know this so stuff. So the, the letters would have been written during those missionary journeys back and forth. So, so we're talking 25 to 30 years. years after the crucifixion and resurrection here, right. mm -hmm. which would be, again, 25 to 30-ish years since Pentecost, since that happened mm -hmm. not long mm -hmm. after the whole Jesus thing, mm -hmm. right within, a, what, a couple months? Yeah. Okay. You definitely get the picture, though, that, that when, when Apollos, Priscilla, and Aquila, and then definitely Paul arrive, that's when things really take off. Yeah, because so it, it just it doesn't come up like anywhere else. There were some believers there, but that's when all of a sudden it really takes off. So, yeah, it, it's interesting to think about that, though, because Acts happens really fast, and there's not much acknowledgement by Luke of how much time went by in between here or in between. Yeah. I mean, it just happens really, really quick, yeah. where you just get, like, then 18 months passed. He hung out there and talked to some people or did some stuff, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like this is action-packed and it's happening really quick, but if this church had been established to even some degree right. for 30 years, I mean, what mm -hmm. were you doing 30 years ago? Yeah, well, I was in sixth grade. I mean, yeah. 
That's a long time. I mean, that's like seventh grade, I guess. I mean, Goonies and yeah. you know that era of things. <laughs> this is well, yeah, so, so this so this is a church that. I mean, the world wasn't like it was at the time of Jesus. It had culturally evolved three so, decades by decades. this point. Well, time had moved on, but you know, in the ancient world, things didn't move. Culture didn't shift as quickly as it does now. Greek culture and cosmopolitan cities moved quicker, mm-hmm. is my understanding. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, but didn't have sure. wouldn't have the huge shifts. No, no, like, no, no. Where technology yeah, redefines you know, culture yeah. quickly, like it yeah. does. Yeah, yeah it's fair. Shifts in ideas, mm-hmm. but. You still went to the market and bought bread and wine the same way you always had. Well, we still go to the market and buy bread. And, well, I mean, unless you're a really good Christian like me, and yeah. then you buy yeah. Coca-Cola, right. yeah, because so. that's better. Yeah. So, um, what was I going to say there? I lost my thought. I don't know, but it was going to be Oh, smart. I was going to say that the uh, it, what we don't know was the people there, were they, were they actually a church? As we would think of today, were they a gathering? I mean, well, were, well, we have a little bit of a hint that they might not have been because it says that all this stuff was happening in the synagogue in chapter right. 19. So they, if, if they are a church, they still think of themselves as being uh, part of Judaism, mm-hmm. which means that Ephesus would have been, like if your church stuff is still happening in the synagogue, they hadn't been it means it would have been yet. a pretty weird version of Christianity for Gentiles to participate mm-hmm. in. So it's still mostly Jewish. Yeah, and, and, and it, it means that the, Jews hadn't gone the Christians who are signing up for the Jesus thing are probably having to adopt a lot of those Jewish things that other yeah, other parts of the Christian world had sorted out a little bit. Right. The Jerusalem Council and, and all of that business. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that I think Ephesus might have been a little bit behind the curve Maybe in like terms it. of the gentilification. Gentilification. Oh, that actually sounded better with that, that kind of soft L. I'm going with that. The gentilification of the whole thing. Um, so, so that I makes me suspect. Either I or I coined a word. Uh, there's no reason it can't be both. Sure. So, so it seems like the, the, the church that's being founded here is maybe even a little bit of a time capsule. Maybe because you've got the looks like the it. John the Baptist time capsule, mm-hmm. so they're still processing through stuff from, and the John the Baptist stuff is like that's a long time. Well, ago. that's and that's 35, like, 40 years at like, this what point. Was, you know, like five percent, five or ten percent of the story. Mm-hmm. They they don't have, so it seems like they're, you know, you assume John the Baptist talked about there comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Did he include the crucifixion, resurrection? You would assume so, but. And there's a lot that is not included yeah. in, in, in that. You kind of assume none of Jesus' oral teachings. Well, what, what was the message of John the Baptist? Repent and believe. Repent and be baptized, repent and believe. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah those of you who are doing this mean thing to other people, you got to knock it off. Those uh-huh. of you who are doing that, you got to knock it off, yeah. right? Like yeah, That's a bad paraphrase, but to, yeah. that was the message. So, I mean, yeah, it was preparation for Jesus, mm-hmm. which means that it looks like at least a decent chunk of mm-hmm. this church, the Ephesian church, was founded on just like the warm-up business. Like if you like if you went to church today and all the church covered was like, hey, the world has problems, but there's a God. Like that's good. Mm-hmm. It's a nice start. There's just a lot more to it. Right. And so these guys were very much still at the 101 level when... Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe that explains Paul why shows up. When, when, when Paul shows up, it takes off. Yeah, because everybody's everybody's prepared, ready for the thing. Everyone's been prepared. Yeah, and they just, just yeah finish the puzzle for me. Yep. Fill out the rest of this thing. Right, interesting. And yeah, and and that does, that isn't far fetched either because we've seen that kind of thing happen at other points in Acts, mm-hmm. like with the uh, the Ethiopian dude. Right. It's like, hey, I'm reading all this stuff. Like, I'm totally ready. Just mm-hmm. like, need some data. Who's he talking about? Yeah. Well, let me tell you. Yeah, and then I'm it all comes you together. Now you can keep talking. I'm just gonna set this thing. Technical stuff. Just don't worry about this. I'm not a super producer. And you're on your own. You don't have a producer. No, there will be no producing here. Because you are the producer. Yeah, so here's the here's the story <laughs> on where we are and what we're doing. Um, we, we can only film in 30-minute chunks. <laughs> so every 30 minutes, there's going to be a weird your camera shuts a weird off. break. It's a nice camera. It just it gets tired, and it needs breaks. We are in Lead, South Dakota. At least we are 60% sure it's called Lead and not Lead. 65% sure? 
Uh, no one's corrected us. Yeah. It's right. It's in the uh, the Deadwood Gulch area. So I live in Western Wyoming, as we've discussed. Aaron lives in the home of the Bison in North Dakota, and so we met somewhere in the middle, and this seemed like a nice place to meet. And then the people at this, what's it called? Blackstone. Blackstone Inn. Blackstone Inn in Lead. We're pretty sure Lead, South Dakota gave us this cool little pub to sit in and talk. So that's why we're here. And I was really hoping this thing would light up, but it didn't. But you can imagine what it would be like as I promote alcohol with this fancy sign behind us. I'll give you a halo. Yeah. But we were talking about Ephesus, and I got distracted for a minute with camera things and technical stuff. The, um... So the, the city. Cosmopolitan. Multi-ethnic multi-religious, deep into magic, um, deep into idolatry. Um, there's a reference in there, it's kind of kind of veiled in Acts 20, but it looks like the reason that Artemis was, was such a deal there is that it looks like there was a meteor that fell from the sky and it, yeah. it had the appearance of some kind of idol or whatever, and so they, like, supposedly that was in the temple. And uh, so, what did they say, her image, her image that fell from the sky mm-hmm. you know, as I think a meteor mm-hmm. that's you know, pretty interesting they, yeah I mean well and the other interesting thing about Artemis and I don't know how much this will actually factor into us talking about the rest of Ephesians but um, Zeus and Hera mm-hmm. are like Papa God and Mama God of the Greeks right mm-hmm. but these gods have all kinds of personality flaws so Zeus is a little flandery you just had an eye for a lot of the other goddesses, which makes sense because you know, they're built like goddesses. And so he connects with Leto, which always messes with me because I picture Jared Leto, who is, of course, a dude. But Leto, the goddess, or like goddess, and they have these illegitimate twins. And the twins are Artemis and Apollo. Mm-hmm. And Artemis is the older of the two. And she supposedly, according to the mythology, helped her mom deliver her brother. So she was like a midwife immediately. Like she still got the goop on her and everything. Because she's she's a goddess. Yeah, because that's the deal. And so she's the goddess of the hunt and, um, yeah, I I don't know. She she wears our Apollo. Oh, I don't know. Who's Who's the Greek version of Mars? Ares. Aries is the Greek version of Mars. Okay. I could be making Mars crap up. Mars is Apollo. Is yes, he? I don't know. I have no idea. This, I'm into a different religion. I don't, I don't know, I don't know for <laughs> well sure. Well said. Yeah, I, if you want to know how Jesus is related to like God or something. He's better. I have ideas. Yeah. The point is, I think that there is this underlying theme throughout the book of Acts mm-hmm. about the son of God coming into conflict with the son and daughter of the Greek gods. Hmm. And I think you see that in the account at Philippi, where the little slave girl has the Pythonic spirit. And I just did an episode on this. I'll mm-hmm. put up a link or something. The little slave girl has the Pythonic spirit. Mm-hmm. you got to read the Greek to get that that's what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. But the Pythonic spirit is a, a reference to Apollo, mm-hmm. who was the dude who uh, defeated the monster Python at Delphi. Mm-hmm. And that Pythonic spirit is what imbued the oracles at Delphi mm-hmm. with the ability to tell the future. Interesting detail. We totally went there and hung out. And one of the two of us came and went without really insulting Greek culture or being scolded at all. But one of the two of us, and I feel like it might have been you, took it upon themselves to violate everything about Greek culture by standing on the remnants of a column at the Oracle and had to be scolded by the Greek authorities and told to get off of that column no, you were, because of their disregard for everything that is an American. I think it was you. No, that was, you were, you're confusing that moment with the, uh, the moment across, the hill across from the Acropolis. That was where I got scolded. You got yelled at there too? Yeah, I think it was just the one I think you got yelled at twice. And you know what? I think I have pictures. I'm going to find the pictures and show people. Yeah, you getting scolded or standing on the. You showing disregard for Western civilization by standing on a column you weren't allowed to stand on. I was honoring it. What you did was wrong. I was exploring it. And evil. 
evil and punishable. And I hope you feel shame. I don't feel any shame. Okay. So what happens then is this little slave girl is badgering Paul. I mean, right. you, you know the story. And, you know, bugging him and everything. And Paul finally is like, just ah! In the name of Jesus, knock it off. Or, you know, it's more Christian sounding than that. Mm -hmm. And immediately this girl like, loses, loses this spirit and mm -hmm. her ability. And then everybody gets real mad and there's a whole other story that comes with that. Mm -hmm. But I think what stands out from that is that, you know, to us, it just means nothing because we don't think about Greek culture, or gods or goddesses or whatever. But to the original audience, that would have been a, Ooh. whoa. So the son of the God of Abraham wasn't even there. He just got referenced in passing. Mm -hmm. And our rock star favorite God of Greek culture, Apollo, just flicked aside by Paul in the name of Jesus. So, yeah. so there's a little bit of a power encounter again there. Yeah. And then here again, we see Ephesus, the city that celebrates his sister, Artemis, religiously toppled by the gospel in really unceremonious fashion. Just, here's a better idea. And it has power behind it, and people sign up for it. And so I think that, that part of the deal with Ephesus is that, in my mind, at least to the original audience, it would have been a city that was emblematic of how the message and power of Jesus just mm -hmm. ran roughshod over these homemade gods. Roughshod, I guess I would use a different language because it, it didn't run roughshod in a way that it forced it forced itself on people. Agreed. It was just we're here and we're a better thing. And it and it no nobody was ever, you know, like Islam you know, forced by the sword to convert to Christianity. They just looked and said, man, what I've been doing is foolishness compared to this. Fair point. Poor choice of words. No, I, I know what you're saying, but in terms of the power encounter, yeah, it just totally just... What I mean is it was effective it and was, quick. It was effective and quick and just brushed it aside without yeah. any conflict at all. And again... There was no challenge. Now, the Temple of Artemis is part of a church, which yeah. may now be part of a mosque. So I don't know exactly what all that I says. Look that up. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. My phone they knows, would, but you wouldn't do that. Well, Muslims would, but I mean, I don't think that the, the people in Hagia Sophia is in Istanbul, right? Right. Uh, I mean, that's a huge tourist spot. That's like one of the most, got to be one of the most visited sites in the whole city. I think it's a mosque. You know who would know? Google would know. Yeah. Okay, Google, is the Hagia Sophia a mosque or a church? According to Wikipedia, Hagia Sophia, from the Greek Alpha Gamma Iota Alpha Sigma Omicron Phi Iota Alpha Just... Classical Greek Hagia Sophia okay. Byzantine Greek Ajasoia No, I can't listen to you. Latin. Okay, Saint here's what you need to know. Uh, it was a Greek Orthodox Christian church, and it was later converted into an Ottoman mosque, and now it's just a let's not hurt anybody museum. It's just a tourist spot. Yeah. Okay. okay. So everybody can be right. Except for whoever said that it was a Jehovah's Witness hall. That person was wrong. It has never that been. That person wasn't on our podcast. Nope. Nope. So that's what we know so far. Um, so I guess I just feel like the, the whole Ephesus thing, there's a lot of layers of meaning that I think yeah. are a part of this. This isn't just mm -hmm. a town where Christianity happened. I mean, from a completely objective standpoint, even if I'm not into Christianity, this is a place that is emblematic of a triumph. This is a huge, this is a big W. Whereas if we're gonna be fair again, Athens might be a town that is emblematic of an L. It didn't seem like it went very well mm -hmm. in Athens, at least, at least in Acts. Mm -hmm. So, shifting gears a little bit here, maybe that is part of the reason that Ephesians stands out to me as being kind of a unique New Testament letter because it's not fixing anything. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's filling in a narrative. <laughs> because it, if you look at the, the book, it kind of lays it out, chapter one, and then it gives you different pieces to that as you go through two, three, four, five, and six. Chapter 1, it, it says that God had a plan from the very beginning, and that plan is to unite all things under the lordship of Christ. And the 
all of life points to him, okay? And that plan that God had it worked out, he had it mapped out, and he's step by step making that come to bear. And so that conflict between darkness and light is, uh, you know, God says that's all part of my plan. I'm going to make it obedient to the gospel. It's heavyweight stuff. It, I mean, yeah. obviously, Romans and Hebrews are both very weighty. Get into the deep mm-hmm. water. Mm-hmm. Here's what all this stuff means. Here's mm-hmm. you get into even why on some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. They all have, all of them follow the structure of here's a bunch of theology mm-hmm. and some really obvious implications mm-hmm. for you if you buy that theology. Right. Um, Romans has. I think a little bit more of a corrective tone, a pushback on a little bit more of a pushback on culture. Right. In Ephesians. Ephesians has that later on, you know, chapter four, chapter five, where it talks about the thinking of the Gentiles. But Romans is a lot thicker with that critique of culture. Yes. Um, I, Paul. I mean, what church would you say Paul spent the second most amount of time in, or what town? Corinth. Yeah, I would agree. I, yeah, I, think, I think off you know off the top of my head, Corinth is eighteen months. Yeah, I was there was, was a couple was of years, months, but it was a lot. Yeah, and it was a long time. Um, yeah, and I obviously spent time in Antioch and somewhere in there. He went out and hung out in the desert or something, but I've never been clear on exactly where that fits. Yeah, well, since he went into uh, Arabia and was taught by the Spirit. I, 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 I don't that know. Mean? Conversation for another day, I guess. Yeah. Uh, he hung out in Jerusalem, but that I mean, he was at those places pretty for quick. a long time. Like especially Antioch was kind of a home base, but in terms of his missionary places. Corinth and Ephesus, those are the big dogs. Yeah, yeah. So you compare those sets of letters. We got one to the Ephesians, two to the Corinthians. Mm-hmm. We got six chapters to the Ephesians, 20 some to the people of Corinth. And those letters to Corinth are, is scathing too harsh a word? No, they're. They're a beatdown. <laughs> it's a beatdown. <laughs> it's like, what a hey, common Hey, your church. A- it's kind of crappy right now. Yeah, you think dumb things. You treat each other badly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and yeah it, it's a dressing down of those churches. Yeah. And isn't there even rumored to be like a... A, a, a third Corinthians? Yeah, like the, there the, is. the epistle of tears. They call it something like that. I hadn't heard that term, but there is. There is. Um, if you piece together the arguments from first and second Corinthians, um, this is, I'm going clear back to seminary if I recall this discussion. But it looks like there's a third letter that's not been preserved. Right. So yeah. that, I mean, and we could assume that with all of this, it could have been much. Yeah, I've I've heard I've heard smart people argue that uh, that that letter is like the the angry version of the goodbye conversation that Paul had at Miletus when he said goodbye to the Ephesian elders in mm-hmm. Acts twenty one. 20, I 20? I don't know. Yeah. Wherever it happens. It's in the Bible. That's the point. Yeah. Um, so he sends all this content to the Corinthians, mm-hmm. possibly you know, even more than what we have preserved here. Mm-hmm. Um, we know Almost a, another dude who isn't, doesn't come up in the Bible but was working at the same time from the Roman church, a guy named Clement. Mm-hmm. We know he was after the Corinthian church. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were. He was a generation after Paul. Right, right, the same problem right. still, right? Yeah, and that's my understanding. Kind of mess, I right? haven't yeah. read that in forever, but that's mm-hmm. what I recall. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, you got a you got a really problematic church where he mm-hmm. threw a bunch of time, and in a very similar town. I mean, you've got shrine prostitution Larry. and yeah, um, yeah, port city, very cosmopolitan. These are very similar towns. Wealthy, mm-hmm. which can make people difficult to listen. <laughs> so glad to be poor. <laughs> And, and then you've got, by contrast, similar church, similar circumstances, similar amount of time hanging out there. You've got the letter to the Ephesians where I don't even really see a word of correction. It's, there's not much specific in that letter. And like I said, it, I, I think I think I said this already, didn't I? Was it long we talking about it again? It's a long podcast. So uh, that he, you know, would have had a letter carrier. Somebody would have come along. Um, carrying this letter would have given personal greetings, um, but it seems like there was, for this congregation, there wasn't anything specific that he was addressing, at least in this letter. Mm-hmm. So things were, and we know that um, 
Ephesus was one of the first major centers of Christianity, so we know, we know that it thrived and did well. Mm-hmm. There was there was good leadership there, and uh, and they they did well for many centuries. So, how do you think all that stuff that we're throwing out mm-hmm. shaped the way the letter actually reads when we pick it up and look at it now? Well, okay, so it's interesting. You you lay out the the the, the scope of you know the gospel versus uh, the Greek narrative of, you know, Apollo and Artemis is the son and daughter of God and the son of God, the Hebrew Messiah, comes in and, you know, overthrows all that, this narrative of conflict. I always have felt like chapter one of, of Ephesians, that the, the rhetoric is, is just soaring in its height and scope. You know, um, it, it talks about all the things God has done for us in this plan from since before creation was begun and all of these soaring things that he's done all this and the, the language kind of just piles on itself. And I'm, I'm not very good in Greek, but I know enough to know that it, it it's the, the, the way it comes together, like this whole thing from verse 3 to 14 is one big long run on sentence. And it's almost like Paul gets Here's so a bunch awesome. of stuff that I think. Yeah, it gets it's so excited. Super important. And here he goes, and here he goes, and you yeah. can just kind of see the poor scribe just trying to keep up. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. He's like, oh, by the time he gets done, he's like, oh, you know, there's grammars. a couple of those in here. There's like a couple of them, yeah. But especially in chapter one, I mean, the 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 topics and the scope of it are just totally soaring. You know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world he predestined us to be adoption as his sons according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace I mean it's just the whole this whole chapter one starts from before creation began and then by the end of it um, and he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all which again is a convoluted way to say the church is is the physical manifestation and fills all in all well where to take his rule and reign where to take this story to take the supremacy of Christ everywhere we go and make it manifest not just an idea but a reality and so you start from before creation began to boom here to the end of the story and it's like it's all encompassed there, and the themes and the scope and every spiritual blessing. Well, how do you delineate that? You know, he kind of does it in some, but it's like you could make a list forever. Like every spiritual blessing in Christ. You know, so, so the, the language is really rich, I guess. So, so maybe part of this is that there's just a luxury in not having the tyranny of the urgent in front of him. If, yeah. If it might kids doing something stupid I, I want to teach them grand sweeping important truths about mm-hmm. life and the world and relationships mm-hmm. but if they're just doing one stupid thing like I really just need to tackle that one stupid thing right now mm-hmm. and yeah, in a way it's almost like you earn a state of peace where you can get the conversation to those grand sweeping things mm-hmm. and so maybe it makes sense that this style of letter could only happen or uniquely happened here mm-hmm. with the Ephesian church because they'd earned it. Like they'd, yeah. they'd put in the work and functioned to the point where the, really the next thing they needed mm-hmm. was just one big manifesto on what the heck is the point? Put it all in perspective. Why, mm-hmm. why is there a church? Mm-hmm. Who is God? What's he up to? Where do you fit in right. light of all of that stuff? And where's history what do going? You, what do you do with it? Where, mm-hmm. you know, what... What is your role in making this whole thing happen or in participating with this whole thing? Yeah. And you, what are the challenges you're going to face? And how do you overcome those challenges? Mm-hmm. It, it's it's kind of everything. It's sort of graduation speechish in that regard. That yeah. it, it starts with the why and then gets into the more specific stuff, mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah, it, it, it deals with some specific things. But... In a general way, even the book does later on, he'll deal with specific some specific ethics and things, but not in a way that seems like he's correcting stuff. 
at least not overtly. It seems like he's just just teaching generally. Here's how you move from operating in these pagan circles, you know, to a more Christian understanding. Um, so before we, uh, I'm gonna see how much time we have left. Yeah, we got a couple minutes here. Before we actually take a stab at breaking down mm-hmm. the outline, we're, I'm gonna let you do it, and then without listening to the, or having prepared, I'm gonna give you mine. We'll compare notes. Before we do that, what do you make of the suggestion that this letter was, what do they call it, a cyclical letter? Mm-hmm. Like one that was written to sort of Ephesus and maybe all the suburbs? Yeah. To, you know, to all the saints in Ephesus and the Ephesian suburbs and bedroom communities? Well, Here's it, some stuff. it would have been the leading city of that district. So if you could compare it to the seven churches in Revelation, um, you know, that would have been uh, a mail route, basically, the way those seven churches are listed out, and Ephesus was one of them. So um, that's... Most significant of those seven, by a wide margin. Ephesus, mm-hmm. yes, totally. So that's a, totally a possibility. Um, it would also explain sort of the more general nature rather than the specific nature of it. Um, you mean just in that he doesn't name a bunch he of names? Name a bunch and, of people, and he does like he does in other letters, all the places. Right. Yeah, he, he's, you know, oh, and greet this person, greet this person, greet this person. He kind of leaves that out here. Um, so it, it, that's a that's a possibility. Ultimately, we, we don't know. You know, that's the Do one thing it, you get into the New Testament studies, and people say, "Oh, well, this clearly says." Yeah, and yeah, I don't think you can I think, quite I think say, we've both uh, done this long enough to have noticed places where, where somebody says one thing in some commentary in like 1910. And everybody runs with it. And then it. it just keeps popping up. Yeah. And, and like, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a citation for that observation. I think some dude said it once who a lot of people thought was smart, and, and they just, it just, they just yeah. grabbed so it, and we, it sort we, of becomes fact. Like the, uh, the stupid eye of the needle gate. Thing in, right, in, yeah. the, in the Gospels, yeah. so it's um, it's possible, and it make it w- it would make sense, but we we don't. Know. Does it matter? Like, does, do you feel like it changes the meaning, or that it adds a layer of now stuff we got to consider? It's an important question, and I don't think so. Why not? Why doesn't it matter? Yeah, because there's not a lot that hinges. Okay, so if you're going to try to interpret the Scripture, we say we have an ancient document. And we want to know what the inspired author and the author's original intent, the human author, what they were trying to get at. So we can piece together all of these external pieces to try to give us clues about what they meant. But the best way to interpret scripture is on its own terms. So when we look to like a letter of Ephesians, we can look to Acts and that maybe helps us. We can look to, you know, what I mentioned, Revelation, compare it to Colossians. All of these things inform it. But on its own, I can't think of anything in the letter that hinges on the fact that I know that this was how the letter was written. It stands. It's yeah. clear what it says, and whether it was a circular letter, whether it was whether it was you know the supposed letter to the Laodiceans, that's another discussion mm-hmm. too. Um, yeah, yeah, I have heard that. Um, you know, there's a there's a textual question, and if this gets in too deep, but was it actually, does, does it actually say to Ephesus, or was it meant to be, you know, was the was the scribe meant to just read? Well, it says audience? to the saints in Ephesus, so, I mean, is that wrong if it's a, if it's a cyclical uh, letter? Is that a later edition? Are we to question that one particular clause there? Um, some people question it. Um, I don't, uh, and that's that gets into text criticism issues. You know, uh, when they do this, they don't just have one copy of a Greek letter; they have dozens and dozens, and even hundreds of letters. And um, some of the very, very earliest ones, obviously, the earlier they go back, the the more we assume the more closer they are to a copy of the original, the original letter. We don't have Paul's letter, right? Thank goodness we put it in a shrine someplace and worship it. <laughs> I thought of that. We, we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, you're right. We, we would we put it under glass. We put it under glass and we fight over it. You know, um, what we have is. I bet it uh, would have magic powers. I'm sure it would. Um, Paul would probably have us burn it in the street <laughs> if it did. Um, but if 
but we, we have several hundred copies of this, right? Mm -hmm. And so some don't have that phrase to the saints who are in Ephesus. Do you remember when it appears first? Like, did the uh, earliest manuscripts have that? or it's, I think it's a matter of several early ones in one manuscript family do, and the early ones from another manuscript family don't. So like that's, that's your Byzantine and your Alexandrian yeah, manuscript basically. families? Yeah, basically. But your Alexandrians are the early, early ones. Generally your Byzantines speaking. are the later ones. Generally speaking. Yeah, I don't know which is which. I don't know which one. is which either. I, but, the, but the thing is, the way Ephesians is written, nothing is unclear about what the letter yeah. means. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so you, you can really get lost in the weeds on trying to decide and make an opinion on that stuff. But the bottom line is it, we identify it as Ephesians. There's no reason to not call it Ephesians. I mean, you can say, well... Or to question its authorship. Or to question its yeah. authorship. Yeah. Uh, well, it has a different kind of language than Paul's other letters. Well, well and I think it's good to just be... Yeah, okay. I was going to wrap this up in two minutes. We're going to go a, a little longer, so that's just happening. But the... Uh, I think it is good to just acknowledge minor textual difficulties like mm -hmm, this, mm -hmm. rather than to pretend that, well, I mean, the thing that I have, the version I got, is just irrefutable because right. I like it. And that's an attack on Jesus. If you, Well, the, the thing is, like, okay, so my footnotes say some early manuscripts do not have in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what does that mean? Well, I mean, what's, what are early manuscript copies of Ephesians, 150 years after the fact? Around 200 AD, maybe? Probably, yeah. Yeah. So, I so. Again, I didn't look at the, that information, but... I, I don't feel like this question mm -hmm. in any way calls into question no, anything. the rest of the document. The no. bottom line is, I, I just don't know. So you ask the question, one. why would somebody... Why, why the confusion then? Well, because, let's say, the first people who copied this, um, it was left blank so that it, either they intentionally left it blank so that it could be more widely read or they intentionally included something to help clarify something. So you had, you had well-intending people who were trying, whichever decision they made, whichever situation they were looking at, Keep going. they were trying to make it more clear. Yes. And nothing, nothing, uh, you know, we, we just don't, we don't, have the set of facts that they had knowing why they did exactly what we did sometimes in certain textual situations we can go back and piece it together pretty well yeah in this case uh we don't have a whole lot of information and it really doesn't affect it hugely no it doesn't and this is one of those places where i'm perfectly content to just say yeah eh, i want to acknowledge that there is a mild controversy here about that clause but well, I, the, I don't know. The, the Bible is an actual document that came from an actual place. Uh -huh. It is historically preserved. Uh, totally. And I'm at, I'm at peace with that process. Oh, totally. It doesn't mean I don't have questions about that process. And that I don't think that there's worthwhile scholarship to be done to try to figure out why this is here and not in some other manuscripts. But the fundamental effect that that has on the larger meaning of the document is nil. Whereas you were talking about how in, in some situations it really does matter mm -hmm. because the other side of the conversation in a given letter or part of the Bible makes it clearer. really affects things. Mm -hmm. And the first example that comes to my mind is 1 John. 1 John, mm, I guess, makes sense if you don't think of it as a pushback against a, a Gnostic expression of Christianity. Mm -hmm. It works, I can track with the reasoning. Mm -hmm. But you can tell he's criticizing something. You can tell there's a whole ideology mm -hmm. that John's pushing back on. Mm -hmm. And then when you line it up, you know, for all sorts of reasons I can't get into for the, at the moment, you, when you line it up, you go, oh, it clicks, now I see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It really comes into focus. I don't, I don't get that vibe from Ephesians no. at all. It, no, it's, it, it's clear. It is, and, and, it's proactive, not reactive. And I guess you, that's my point. Yes, and when you see where the, the places are that have those, well, there's a question about the manuscript here, um, they're minimal. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're nowhere in, in any of the substantive areas that's it's in the greeting. Yeah, you know. yeah. And like the one that people really get hung up on in Acts... What is that, 817? Oh, yeah, it's back to that thing we were talking about earlier with the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. People get hung up on... Now I'm making stuff up. Uh, it's in there somewhere. Is it 838? Is that the one you're thinking of? Mm, I don't know. Now I want to know. Let's look. 
Eight. Let me true. Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. You were so wrong. You should be ashamed. It goes to thirty-eight. It skips. Yeah, it skips to thirty-eight. Yeah. Yeah, and there's. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. There's a later manuscript that said, uh, "If you believe with all your heart, you may." Nenik answered, "I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God." That is probably the verse in the New Testament where there's manuscript tension that people get most worked up about. Mm-hmm. But even there, everything on either side really effectively says the same stuff. Yeah. You just have to use your brain a little bit more to read it because it's not hitting you over the head with the again, if, if it iron fist and hammer. Why was it added? To try to make what's already stated. It's not in conflict with the text. It's not in yeah. conflict. Yeah, but at any rate, all of that to say, right. I think it is infinitely fair and reasonable to acknowledge that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. let's let's compare notes on this and then actually get into the, the next episode where we talk text. Um, for your money, give me the... 60 second or less outline of this book. What's the structure of the letter? Hmm. Okay, so chapter one is the overarching theme, kind of the beginning to end, that all things are being brought together in Christ. And then he gets to chapter two, and he says, now, about you, though, where do you fit into this? You were dead, and God made you alive. And that's what we call grace. And God brought you together. And then chapter 2 moves forward to the, the unification of Jews and Gentiles, which is kind of a hard thing for us to, to fathom today because Jews kept themselves completely separate. The, the, this Gentile culture was very relativistic, very pluralistic, and everybody was allowed to have their own God as long as they didn't critique anybody else. Jews didn't want any of that. They didn't eat with them. They didn't fellowship with them. And they were going to be totally separate. And when he comes to chapter 2 and he says, And because God has done this to you, made you alive and made them alive, you're no longer Jews or Gentiles, but you're one new people under the banner of God, under the banner of the gospel. And so then he's, wow, you know. And he says, now this is new stuff. Chapter 3, sorry, I'm pointing. pointing at yeah, me. I'm pointing. Okay. So, so uh, you're allowed to point. <laughs> I just thought I'd make an issue of I it. Could, I could do the uh, president. Oh, the uh, the point of chapter four is the no, that is the most that. impotent gesture. No, it's, it's you can threaten me. Point okay, and threaten, yeah. please. So I'll point at the Bible. So, so he, he says, God did this to you and rescued you, and he's brought you into this people. And he says, now this is something new that nobody's known. It gets to chapter three. This is a mystery. Now, mystery in, in, in the Greek context is not uh, like Agatha Christie or sure. something we're trying to figure out. You know, What it means is there's something that has been planned but hidden and is now revealed. So when he says, now this mystery was revealed to me. In other words, this was all part of God's plan and God chose me to be the one to make it. It's more like the J.J. Abrams mystery box plot device. Sure. Than the riddle to be solved. Sure, yeah. Sure. Not a riddle to be solved. It's the thing that all of a sudden you, you get the, aha, that's what that meant. Yeah. Okay? So the, that, the, the he was dead all along moment at the end of... The Sixth Sense. Spoiler alert, retroactive. Take your word for it. Okay. You didn't see that? I, I don't get in. I don't do films like You never saw The Sixth Sense? No, I don't. Sorry. Seriously? Yeah. Well, I just ruined it for you. That's okay. I'm, I'm watching only, now. I'm go see it. No, go see it. It's, it's been, you know, you're going to have to get it on a VHS cassette at this point. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere I think to I see it. I one of those. Man, um, you're scoring tremendous not cred points right there, well, that's man. that's why I don't have the cool internet channel. Right? Okay. So, oh, well, I see how it is. <laughs> so, um, so chapter three, that's where that is. He explains this mystery, and uh, I'm going to have to look here. I did all that off memory. Yeah. Um, and so then he, he launches into prayer for him uh, towards that goal. And then in chapter four, he says, there, Therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So then chapter 4 and 5 lay out different ethical, this is, this is what it looks like. And, it's, and again, it's kind of a generic, it's a contrast to um, the Greco-Roman assumptions about things. When he gets into chapter 5, um, beginning in verse, well, it's really in verse 18, um, he starts this household code which would have been very common in the ancient world, Greek philosophers, um, the, the ordering and structuring of society and everyone in their place and playing their role, 
um, was a common ethical theme. And so Paul says, I want you to do this and this and this. And there's, there's, if you get into the details of that, it's really fascinating. Um, the, the places that he says... We'll get into all of that when yep. we get to those. Let's, we'll, not, let's not burn through that just yet. Yep. Well, it, the places that he says things that you would have anticipated or the audience would have anticipated mm-hmm. and places where he takes a sharp left turn mm-hmm. and leaves them... And all three of those household relationships come with one of those. All three of them come yeah. with those, yes. Um, yeah. And then it wraps up. It kind of comes full circus, so circle with the, the theme of um, we're in a spiritual conflict. Now, everything that I've laid out, all the spiritual blessings, God plans, God's plan from beginning the ages to bring all things together into Christ. Now, to make that happen is a spiritual conflict, and so then that's how he wraps up in chapter 6. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. And it's longer than 60 seconds. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's you know, eight, or, eight or ten times longer, but actually that's conservative. <laughs> it's hard to explain. It's a lot of content. I get it. Um, yeah, that, that, that resonates. It's interesting, though, when we work on this a little bit in isolation and then put our heads together, yeah, that so we're that operating nice. off of a, a little bit different outline, though similar. I would put it like this. Okay, please. Opens in chapter one saying, here is the big story of all the things. God is the author of all the things, he made all the stuff, mm-hmm. and this God who is ridiculously powerful in the midst of making all of these important things also thought of you. Mm-hmm. And I'm inserting a lot here, but he knew all the stupid stuff you'd do, he knew everything about who you are and what you were going to be, and he still made you. And that means that you are the product of great effort and great forethought, which means that you matter. Mm-hmm. Not so much because you're the infinitely special snowflake, but because, you know, I love that. some, <laughs> the most powerful being thought of you and made it happen. There's no getting around the reality that this is maybe your most predestiny passage in the whole Bible, and it's just there. God put effort into this, and you're the product of forethought. Whether you want to use Calvinist words or not Calvinist words, mm-hmm. this cannot be argued. It's present. So right. that... I feel like this whole thing goes from big picture in chapter one down to narrower picture, narrower picture, narrower picture, and then just like the shapely lady goes back out to big picture toward the end. Mm -hmm. And so as we get into chapter two, see that exactly the same way you do. Now here's uh, here's where you fit with this thing. Uh, I guess end of chapter one has this as well that you you know we become children and heirs of God. So our destiny has changed, and they have this inheritance that we get into mm-hmm. more later, and then into chapter two, and it's kind of like this corrective. And just to be clear, none of that's because you're awesome or did something awesome. Mm-hmm. All of that is again because God put tremendous forethought and effort into making you into this thing as an individual, mm-hmm. and He did that in part because he had stuff in mind that he was preparing for you to do, a role to play role in this play. whole cosmic story. So you have this giant story, mm-hmm. and you get into chapter two, you're like, whoa, he's saying that like, I, I'm an actor in mm-hmm. this story, I'm an agent, I matter in this story. Yeah, I like, I like agent better than actor. Yeah. So you get into chapter three, and then we go from the individual level to like the group level, is saying that because this work has happened in individual people, these weird old social religious barriers that we have right now, like God, they're gone. They're just, we're completely dismissing all of that as no longer necessary. It's neither here nor there. We're just moving on because God has broken down this dividing wall and made this new thing, this new people group mm-hmm. that he's going to use to participate in accomplishing this grand story that was introduced all the way back in chapter 1. Then you get into chapter three, and those ideas get fleshed out a little bit more. And Paul goes on this interesting long aside, like reminding maybe some people in Ephesus who wouldn't know his story yes. or where he fit yeah, I, yeah. of why he has credibility and why he would know how to explain all of these grand things he just explained. And then we get into chapter four, and I'm with you. For me, the, the whole book hinges one, two, three, four, five, six. This is, this is the, the pivot point of the whole thing. And we go, from the, we go from the part of this that is all about you getting who God is, what he's doing, and who you are and where you fit into this. Mm-hmm. No specifics. To me, the first three chapters as I work through this are like the Karate Kid where you're just waxing things. 
and you're just sanding. And you're like, really? You're just sweeping. Yeah. You're like, well, why? Why do I need to know all this stuff? And then you get into four, and it's like, oh, because, you know, wax on. Ho, oh, ho. Now I get it. And so, so there's nothing to do in the first three chapters. Mm -hmm. It's all just abstract. You didn't know this before. Now you know this. Mm -hmm. Now you get it. Then chapter four rolls you over into the, okay, now let's try out the skills. What does this do? What does this do? And, and the contrast that defines all of this is there's one way of thinking that is, hey, we live, we die, we convert food into poop and beer into urine, and then that's it. And that's how you know the people who have no awareness of this live. And there's a certain lifestyle that just goes with that. You can't really blame them. And then there's this lifestyle that should go with it if you decide to track with what I'm saying. And it doesn't look like that other lifestyle because you're not a factory that converts burritos into poop. You are someone who was thought of in advance and made through great power. You're a cosmic and agent. You're, yeah, you got a role to play. And so then you go through all you of these like things. Most you go through all of these things, and what you've got is still very little specific. You've got principles of if you believe this stuff that we said in these first three chapters, how does that affect what you use your words for? Mm -hmm. What you use your time for? How you treat your wife? How you treat your husband? How you treat your son? How you treat your daughter? How you treat your household servants or even slaves? And if that's mortifying to you, we'll get into what that all means later. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, as we get down to the end of chapter five and then into six, now we're all the way down to the most intimate level. So it starts with, in light of all this stuff we covered in the first three chapters, how do you think differently? In light of all that stuff, how does your invisible personal life that nobody could judge or measure or really know from the outside, how does that work differently? How does your public social life look different in terms of treating people you work with or hang out with, you might irritate, you know, stuff like that. Now let's take it all the way to the level of the home. What about the super private version of yourself that interacts with only your most inner circle? Mm -hmm. How does it affect that? And then I feel like it gets to the end of all that stuff and Paul knows that everybody would be feeling like, crap, that is a lot. Mm -hmm. That's a, so much to take in. And then he has this little thing at the end where he takes it back out to the big picture and says, if that's overwhelming, it sort of should be. Because you're not just up against yourself or your own willpower. You're up against actual, he would say, spiritual opposition mm -hmm. that has a vested interest in your failure and the failure of the plans of God. Mm -hmm. And he wraps it up with this whole idea that, but don't worry. One, you don't have to win. You just have to endure. And two, God's going to give you everything you need to be able to endure and, and stand while God does the winning part. Has given, will give. Yeah, and then... Blah, 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 blah. I like all of you. Bye-bye. Right. So that would be my stab at an outline. What parts do you think sound left fieldish compared to your outline there? I like it, actually. Um, and it's, you know, it's... You know, Isaiah says... Uh, Isaiah 54, 55, I think it's 55. There's no chance I'm going to know. Uh, God's word is living and active. No, no, I'm thinking of Hebrews. Uh, I'm, that's, that's a different thing. Yes, yeah, that's... that's it. Sorry, yeah. Isaiah says uh, Denver Seminary. Like, God, that's what it. Oh, that's, <laughs> they didn't give me the degree. They just gave me that. They just got you the hat and the rejection so, the letter. The hat and rejection <laughs> letter. No, I'm confusing. Isaiah says that uh, that all scripture, um, that God, it uh, it will accomplish what He sent. Okay, so to Isaiah, you're yeah. talking about yeah, but, but, God's but word won't return of, void. Yeah, it won't return void. But I'm thinking you're talking of about Hebrews, the living and active living in and Hebrews. Hebrews. Yeah. Yeah, and um, then all scriptures God breathed. That's in Second, Second Timothy. Timothy three. Right. Yeah. Got so. It. Those are the three. I cram all of those together in my brain as yeah, well. Yeah, so yeah, sometimes so when I'm like, talking wait, about yeah. Christian-y things and yeah. need to sound smart, but I can't remember which is which, yeah. I just lump them all into one conglomerate verse, yeah. but don't cite a reference and assume people will just kind of fill in the gaps and it'll seem legitimate. Kind of, wow, that's so Christian. Well, yeah. it's, I'm, yeah. I've read several parts of the Bible. So, <laughs> so um, what was I going to say? Oh, well, so it, it's living. And, um, you know, so I think... You know, God will take that and speak. You know, it, neither of those are really mutually exclusive. Um, mm. Just have different emphasis and, and a different way to look at it. I think, you know, 
that's that's the beauty of it is that God takes it and speaks in, in, in unique ways. When we try to take him on his, his terms, he still meets us on ours. Hmm. Uh, that was snappy. I'm, uh, maybe I should tweet that. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but, yeah, I, I don't see anything necessarily in profound friction. I guess we'll find mm-hmm. out more when we actually go through the thing. And if we get to have a fight, that'll just be fun. And if we don't, we'll fake it. So, you know, so there's jeopardy and tension. So people enjoy what they're listening to. Um, the, the, the two things that stand out to me between our outlines that really match up are these ideas that you've got a very big picture. One of the biggest big picture statements at the beginning of the first half of this in chapter one. Here's how all the things are. Is there a, is there a, is there a spot in the Bible where there's a bigger... The twin book to Ephesians, maybe Colossians 1. I mean, it, it's, it talks it's about the supremacy the of Christ. Yeah, Colossians 1 that, you know, that's... But even that deals more with Jesus and less with you. This is, this is, through scope and sequence, this is... It's a monster, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, of course, the, the, the themes aren't unique to Ephesians. But they're all together in one spot. They're all together in one spot. So if you didn't have Ephesians, you could come up with exactly the same theology because it's affirmed throughout the rest of the scripture. But it's 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 pretty right. I don't know what that gesture meant, but yep. Was that were you painting? Were you doing calligraphy? Was that a a smaller sledgehammer? I didn't know what. Oh yeah. Okay. Something like that. And I think we also definitely agree that there's a pivot point at the end of chapter three. Totally. It goes from big picture ideas to here's what you're going to do and how we would maybe organize that second half sounded a little different, but we're in the same neighborhood. Yeah. I kind of went running commentary. You were sort of more thematic, but yeah. Yeah. We're essentially essentially We'll find something to fight about and it's going to be fun. So here's what we're going to do. This is, um, I think we're at nine hours so far on this episode. So we're going to stop. And um, we're gonna we're gonna break this up. We'll do we'll do chapter one next. Um, you're gonna be noticing that we're really gonna be wearing the same outfit because we're just gonna turn right around and do it. You'll also notice um, probably a faint uh, reaction to each other's aroma as we sit here longer and sweat and gradually become more disgusting. But we're gonna power through this in the interest of getting this all done in one day because it's a very long commute. So. If you're having fun with this kind of stuff, I know this is totally different than everything else that I do on my channel, but if you enjoy it and you find value in this, please subscribe to my channel and check out the wide array of different things that we're doing around here as well. Aaron, you do not do the YouTube thing per se, but you do have the, uh, you have sermons online, right? I do, yeah. Where can people find that if they think you sound smart? Um, Emmanuel Baptist with an I. Emmanuel Baptist, uh, Beulah, North Dakota. You got to type all of that, like uh, into if your you interwebs. Google that, yeah, if you Google uh, that, or you could. Like, what's your you website? Say, it's uh, URL. Uh, ibcbeulah.com. How do you spell Beulah? B-E-U-L-A-H. I always use voice recognition, so I don't have to screw it up. Yeah. That way, if somebody screws it up, it was that Google lady. B-E-U-L-A-H. Beulah, North Dakota. IBC Beulah. Emmanuel Baptist Church. Beulah. Ibcbeulah.com. If if you like the way we do it on this channel and, and kind of the tone that we take, you will get less screwing around from Aaron's content. <laughs> but he puts stuff together in a way that's very tight and uh, it's smart, it's sharp, it's well informed and well researched. But if you'd like to hear somebody else who sort of comes at it the same way I do, but isn't me, this could be a refreshing option. So ibcbeulah.org. Com. Dot com. You got the dot com. Cool. We're shutting up. We'll do another one of these in just a minute. Thanks for hanging out with us.